In 1998, the first version, or rather an idea of what RuneScape was going to be, began development as Devious Mud. MUD, or M-U-D, stands for Multi-User Dungeon, which at the time was a popular game genre where players were set in an online world that was usually text-based and could vary from style of gameplay. The first version of Devious MUD was written by Andrew Gower while studying at Cambridge University and was only played by him. Come 1999, the second and much more refined version was released to the public and ran day and night on Andrew's computer. It had only two shops, ten items, and one incomplete quest being the Sheep Shearer quest. In all, Devious Mud was only up for about a week and played by 15 people, including Andrew Gower and his two brothers, Paul and Ian Gower. The following year was spent developing RuneScape, or as we know it now as, RuneScape Classic. On January 4, 2001, RuneScape was finally launched. It released with 6 quests and 12 skills, all of which still exist today. And 17 days after its release, on January 21st, it got its first big update as two new locations were added, al Karid and Draenor Manor, both of which can be seen on the original Devious Mud map. Alongside these new locations, the Ernest the Chicken quest was added in front of Draenor Manor, and still on the same update, another welcome addition came in the form of banks that at the time could only store coins. The next month brought us the Imp Catcher quest on the 16th, and on the 28th, the Prince Ali Rescue quest. Also, our very first taste of PvP, and I'm not talking about the wilderness. Instead, players had to choose when creating their account if they wanted to become a player killer or a non-player killer. Choosing to become a player killer meant that you could be attacked at any time by another player killer, except when in safe zones. And for those of you that are familiar with RuneScape, this was essentially Deadman mode. If you chose to become a non-player killer, players couldn't attack you and you couldn't attack other players. And if at any time you didn't like the choice you picked, you could change it, but only twice. Which, as you would imagine, would be quite annoying for some players. Next, the first of many guilds would arrive on March 17th in the form of the Cooking Guild, which gave players interested in cooking a central hub. Next month, on April 6th, RuneScape got its first big expansion in the form of Asgarnia. This brought us one of the most well-known cities being Falador along with four new quests. Prior to this update, there was a gate blocking off players from this location, and when clicked on, read, Coming soon, Kingdom of Asgarnia. Almost exactly one month later, more quests for the new expansion, a third server to old RuneScape's ever-expanding player base, and the crafting skill was added. And at the time, you could only make pottery and jewelry, neither of which could be banked, so it's an understatement when I say it was very difficult to train this new skill. 16 days later, good and evil magic are formed into a single skill, B magic, and the prayer system that we're all familiar with was added. The following day, and a second time in a month, a fourth server was added. And finally, on June 11th, the much-needed fishing skill was introduced along with the pirate's treasure quest, which accompanied the fishing island of Karamja. This skill made cooking a whole lot easier as there was less prep work needed and provided copious amounts of much-needed food for players partaking in PvP. 12 days later, and 53 days after the skill was released, tailoring was added to the crafting skill, which meant players could now make leather armor. Now the next update is very interesting because this would be the first time we would see a now valuable discontinued item. On July 12th, Silver Ore was released as well as the Black Hole Experience which was an area located within the Dwarven Mines that's sole purpose was to store banned players. Upon being banned, you would find yourself in this big black empty space wandering endlessly. This mysterious place gained such a reputation, players were actually trying to get themselves banned to see it for themselves. Because of this, Jagex released a disc of returning that would allow non role breaking players to explore the black hole safely. As you would expect, this caused issues, as banned players would convince normal players exploring the black hole to drop the disc, meaning that they would become stuck in there. Five days later, on the 17th, a fifth server was added, and on the 26th, players received the much needed bank update that allowed them to store up to 40 items within their bank when it had previously only stored coins. This day also marks the day that Runite armor was released, making it the best armor in the game. Next month, another massive expansion that would change RuneScape forever. Ghost Town was changed into Edgeville. No, but really the wilderness was finally introduced, which meant players no longer had to choose between being a player killer or a non-player killer, as there was now a designated zone for PvP, so now all players could do both, which introduced all players to another side of the game they have yet to experience. The following two months only had one major update, being the Dragon Slayer quest. This was the most difficult quest that RuneScape had ever seen, as well as the best reward from one, as after completion of the quest, players could purchase a Rune Chain Body, which at the time was the best piece of armor in game. The next month, on Halloween, we got our first holiday event where the now discontinued pumpkins were dropped all around Gilinor. 
the Draenor market was released, this was our first introduction to certificates, also known as certs, and current day known as notes. A certificate is tradable and equivalent in value to five of the equivalent non-stackable items. The non-playable characters, also known as NPCs, found in Draenor Market could exchange fish, bars, and ores into certificates, and vice versa, making trading these items in large quantities much easier. On the same day black weapons were released, along with adding level requirements to armor and weapons, the final update of 2001 came on Christmas Day in the form of a holiday event. Players could find Christmas crackers scattered all over the floor and use them on other players to obtain various items including the most expensive rares in RS3 besides the Christmas cracker itself, party hats. Now moving on to January 4, 2002, exactly one year after RuneScape was released, two more servers were added. The rest of the month and most of February was spent working on RuneScape's newest and possibly largest expansion. And finally, on February 27th, membership was introduced, which accumulated over 5,000 members within the first few days as players wanted to explore the new members-only area known as Taverly. Membership came with five new quests, Dragons, Dragonstones, The Crafting Guild, the first dragon weapons in game, and a new skill, Herblaw, or as many of us know today, Herblore, which allows players to make a variety of potions. But of course, none of this would be accessible without first purchasing membership. What this new influx of members meant is RuneScape had the capital to expand and would no longer be worked on solely by the Gower Brothers, but also the various employees that would eventually form Jagex LTD. And this definitely showed as on March 18th, players received blood runes that released alongside high level spells, the wilderness area in Edgeville Dungeon, and glass making, which was an expansion to crafting, meaning that players could make objects like vials and battle saves. Three days later, two more RuneScape servers were added, which totaled eight worlds that could hold a capacity of 10,000 total players. And on the 25th, another skill and a very popular crafting method was released, being fletching and spinning flax. The following month, on the 9th, the Family Crest quest was released, which introduced players to cooking gloves, that are still today a very popular item that reduces the burn rates of food when worn. It would be 21 days later that we would see the addition of the thieving skill, the City of Ardoin, along with the Tribal Totem quest, which introduced the player to the new skill. Only 10 days later, Fire Giants were released, along with a makeover mage that would allow you to change your appearance, and most excitingly, level 56 Wilderness was open. This gave players interested in PvP more locations to PK. At the end of the month, on the 28th, two new quests were added to the western side of Gilinor being a monk's friend and the fishing contest. One day later, on the 29th, Jagex stat wiped 2,000 accounts accused of macroing. This marks the first time Jagex has taken serious action against bots, which are players that run scripts on their computers to play the game for them. The month of June only saw the release of the Clock Tower and Temple of Ekov quest. Alongside the Fishing Guild, where players could come together and catch various types of fish and had NPCs that could make more certificates for the various fish being caught. July brought bug fixes and reliable customer support, as well as three new members only areas and quests being the Holy Grail, the Trino Village, and the Fight Arena quest. We would see a continuation of this next month as on August 15th, two more members quests were added being Hazil's Colt and Sheep Herder. This month would also bring RuneScape's first ever multi-part quest, Plague City, which arrived on the 27th. Following the same tradition, the next month brought the Sea Slug quest on the 9th and the Waterfall quest on the 24th. Two major updates would also arrive this day that would act as landmarks for RuneScape. Tutorial Island, which served to show new players on how the game is played, and the first ever boss the King Black Dragon. This boss could drop extremely rare Runite weaponry alongside the much sought after Dragon Medium Helmet, as at the time this was the first and only Dragon Armor piece in game. Fast forward almost exactly one month later on October 23rd, the second part of the multi-quest series that Plague City kicked off was added in the form of the Biohazard quest. Taibo Wanai Village was added as an expansion to Karamsha with the addition of the Jungle Potion quest, the Town of Yanil was added and came packaged with new spells that utilized soul runes, and dragons would finally drop dragon bones which gave a decent amount of prayer experience when buried. Seven days later on Halloween, and keeping with tradition, Halloween masks were dropped all over RuneScape, but unlike this update and nearly the rest that have been implemented since then, the next one would be despised by the entire RuneScape community. November 13th, 2002 marks the day the fatigue system was implemented. What this system did is add a fatigue counter that would increase when gathering resources or doing most things that gain experience. 
Once filled, players would stop gaining experience and resources until they would rest in one of the many beds around RuneScape. And like most unfavorable updates, this one was added to combat the ever-growing botting issue as it would apply pressure by slowing down bots and will require more complex scripts to be able to locate beds. And although Jagex denied it, it was generally accepted that the fatigue system slowed down XP rates, making training any skill much slower. On a lighter note, the next update will be a welcomed one as on December 12th, the agility skill along with the Grand Tree quest was added. This introduced players to useful shortcuts, although scarce, made traversing the game world easier as well as adding exclusive areas where only players with high agility levels could access. And finally, for the last update of 2002, on Christmas Day, Santa hats, like the Christmas crackers that came prior, were dropped Oliver Gillinor, making it the third in a series of discontinued tradable hats. So this video was originally supposed to be the entire history of RuneScape Classic, but it went on for a bit too long, so depending on if you guys want it and how this video does, I'll release the history of RuneScape Classic 2003 through 2018. I also want to give a special thanks to Goldscape that allowed me to use his footage of his RuneScape Classic Iron Man, channel link in the description, you should really go check him out, as well as July the RuneScape History Guy's channel. He runs a great channel with crazily in-depth information on everything RuneScape, so if you want extremely accurate RuneScape videos, I'd recommend to go check out his channel. So yeah, if you guys want 2003 through 2018, just let me know and I'll be happy to make it. This has been the History of RuneScape Classic 1998 through 2002. Thanks for watching.